Hello everyone, welcome back to my YouTube channel Physiology Learning. I am Dr. Ram. In today's series, we are going to discuss about the laws in sensory physiology. We are discussing our CNS lectures under which we are discussing the sensory system and today it is going to be the last topic of our sensory system that is laws in sensory physiology. So coming to the learning objective of today, we are going to discuss various law. They will be discussed under these headings that is the bell Mezzendi law, Weber law, weber fechner law, Stephen power law, then labeled line principle, law of projection and Muller's doctrine of specific nerve energy. Don't get carried away with all these names. We will try to make it as simple as possible. And in this, these three topics that is Weber law, weber fechner law and Stephen power law will be combined together and explained together. And this label line principle, law of projection and law of specific nerve energy will be discussed together. So coming to the bell Mezzendi law, this is the simplest law among all these law. It states that the dorsal roots are sensory afferents and the ventral roots are motor efferents. It is pretty simple in our dorsal column as well as the ventrospinolateral spinothalamic law, we saw that they reach the dorsal side of the spinal cord. This law just indicates the location of dorsal afferents as well as the ventral motor efferents. The dorsal, so you can see here, the dorsal afferents, that is the sensory system afferents, they reach the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. They, this, these dorsal roots form the sensory afferents and they go towards the brain. Whereas the motor impulses from the brain, they travel downwards and they reach the anterior side. This anterior side is also called as ventral roots and they form the motor efferents. They are going to come out of the spinal cord and then innervate the muscles and the action can be performed. This specific directional pathways is given as bell Mezzendi law. Now coming to the second three laws that is Weber law, weber fechner law and Stephen power law. All of these three laws, they indicate the intensity discrimination. We will try to understand what is this discrimination of intensity. They all of them come under one roof of concept that is Perception of change in intensity of the stimuli depends upon the original strength of the stimuli. Then it also states that perception of stimulus does not directly correlate with the physical matrix. I know these two terms are very very complicated. Let's try to understand them very simply. So let's talk about some examples then we will go back to the statements. So first thing is can you observe this diagram? In this diagram in the section part 1 you can see here the above one it is having 10 dots and the below one is having 20 dots. So is there any noticeable difference? Just have a look and tell me. Yes, that there is a notable, noticeable difference that the second one is having more number of dots. Now come to the second diagram. Let us see. Here they have given 110 dots and the next diagram is just 120 dots. Is there any noticeable difference between these two diagrams? I could not find any noticeable difference. Of course, most of us will not be able to find out any noticeable difference. But coming to the point here, here in both the diagrams only 10 dots are increased. But in one case we are able to appreciate the difference, in another case we are not able to appreciate the difference. I will give you one more example and try to make it more simpler. Let us try to understand. Suppose you are having a 1 kg of weight in your hand and I add just 100 grams more this 100 grams I am adding to your 1 kg which you are already carrying. Then I give you another scenario wherein I give you 5 kg initially, 5 kg I give you initially, then I try to add 100 grams more to this 5 kg now. This is scenario number 1, this is scenario number 2. I again give you 100 grams over this 5 kgs. Whenever you are holding 1 kg of weight and suppose if I had 100 more grams, you might be able to perceive some change in stimulus like you might say that that I have increased your weight and you will say that now you can feel a raised or a increased intensity of the weight. So here you will be able to perceive the difference. But in the second scenario you are already holding a kg of 5 kg. If I add just 100 grams you will not be able to notice any change in stimulus. But then in the second scenario if I give you 500 grams more for example over this 5 kg I am giving you 500 grams more. At this time, maybe you will be able to appreciate the increased in strength of stimuli. So what is happening here? Here in the first scenario, when I add both 100 grams, in one case I was able to feel the difference, in another scenario I was not able to feel the difference. 
So let's try to understand this concept which we studied in the statements. So that the perception of change in intensity of the stimuli depends on the original stimulus. If the original stimulus is already less and I am giving a second stimulus of little more, then it can be perceived. Suppose if the original stimulus is already very high, the same amount of increased stimulus which I gave in the previous sample will not be able to elicit any change in difference of weight. And in this 5 kg, I add up 500 grams. Will you able to identify a greater difference or just noticeable difference? In the second scenario also, you will feel the same increase in weight as you felt for the 1 kg. Like in 1 kg, if I increase the 100 grams, you are feeling an increase in sensation. And for the 5 kg, I am increasing 500 grams. Again, you will be able to feel the same increase in perception which you felt for the 1 kg and 100 grams. Here the physical metrics are completely different like 100 grams and 500 grams. But the perception felt is very similar because of the change in initial strength of the stimulus. The second statement says that the perception of stimulus does not directly correlate with the physical metrics. This 1 kg increased by 100 gram, the feeling is same to that of the 5 kg increased by 500 grams. This perception does not depend upon the physical metrics like 100 grams and 500 grams. That's what this statement says. I hope you can understand these examples. If you do, can't understand this, please try to replay it and then see for one more time. So coming to the uh, scientist, first scientist that is Weber. Weber is the first pioneer in this study and what he said that, he said that this just noticeable difference that is indicated by delta S, that is a just noticeable difference. He identified a relationship between the just noticeable stimuli and the intensity of the original stimulus and he found that their ratio is always constant. For example, the delta S divided by the original stimulus, he said that it is constant. Let's try with our examples, again in our uh, arbitrary example also. Here we can see that in case scenario number 1, the just noticeable difference was created by 100 grams over the 1 kg weight, which is 1000 grams. The ratio becomes 0.1. Whereas in the second scenario, the 500 grams were able to elicit for the 5 kg, which is 5000 grams. And here also the ratio is 0.1. This thing was observed by Weber and he identified that this ratio is constant. But this has a demerit that this constant ratio is not seen for various different kinds of stimulus. Like it was not applicable for all the stimuluses like auditory, visual, sensory and all kinds of stimuluses. So, but this law is still accepted but it is not applicable for all different kinds of stimulus. In some of the books, it is written like this, that is a noticeable difference, that is a just noticeable difference is equal to constant k into the initial strength of the stimulus. It is pretty simple, as and when the initial strength of the stimulus increases, what was happening to the just noticeable difference stimuli, it is also increasing. As we have seen here, whenever the 5 kg was used, I have to use at least 500 grams to make a just noticeable difference. So, what did Weber say? Weber said that where the just noticeable difference is equal to constant k into intensity of the initial stimulus. Next coming to the Fechner law. Fechner is just the student of uh, Weber. So he contributed something to the science and he named his professor's name also along with it calling Weber Fechner law. So coming to the second concept that is Weber Fechner law. Fechner wanted to establish a relationship between the strength of the stimulus and intensity of the sensation felt by the subject. He, what he said that intensity of the sensation felt, that is I, the I is nothing but the intensity of sensation felt. This I was found to be equal to that of a constant K and log of the initial strength of the stimulus. Fechner found out that intensity of sensation was proportional to that of the logarithmic scale of the initial strength of the stimulus and he plotted it in a graph also and this graph was able to explain the Weber law also. So this graph goes like this. So Fechner established this law by plotting the strength of stimuli along the x-axis and intensity of sensation felt along the y-axis. Let's rewind back to our old example. So let's see what happens when 1 kg is increased by 100 grams and 5 kg is increased by 100 grams. So we see here this 1 kg whenever if it is increased by 100 grams there is a 
noticeable increase in sensation felt. As you can see here, there is a noticeable increase in sensation felt by the subject. Whenever this happened in the 5 kg, suppose this is a 5 kg mark and you are increasing it by 100 grams. As we can see here, whenever this 5 kg example was used, just by increasing 100 grams, there was not any visible increase in sensation of perception. There was not visible increase in sensation of perception. So what is this law? This is nothing but our Weber's law. So Fechner's uh, description was able to explain the Weber's law. That's why it's called Weber-Fechner law. Now coming to our third law, that is Stephen power law. Stephen observed that there is some demerit in case of Weber-Fechner law. What is the demerit? This logarithmic scale was not suitable for various different kinds of intensities. They were not very good for establishing different kinds of intensity. And he said that it's not the logarithmic scale which is more useful. It is the exponential powers that is very good for the expression of stimulus strength and the intensity of perception felt by the subject. What he gave us the third law that is Stephen power law. He said that intensity of sensation felt is equal to a constant k multiplied by the strength of the stimulus to the exponential power n. And this n, he was very specifically saying that it is not same for different, different kinds of sensory feelings. For example, this n value is different for a sensory stimulus and this n value is different for a visual and it is different for an auditory stimulus. And one example, this n value is equal to 1 where in case of sensory stimulus was given by Stephen Power. All these three laws are acceptable and some of them have some demerits but they still hold very true in case of neuropsychology to observe the different kinds of sensory modalities felt by the subject. Now coming to the next set of law that is label line principle, specific nerve energy and law of projection. What is this label line principle? This label line principle already we have seen it in our ascending track discussion itself wherein we saw that what is this pathway? Can anyone spot it and tell me? We have done our ascending tracks. This pathway is crossing at the medulla. So what it should be? It should be our dorsal column pathway. So what is the sensation it carries? It carries fine touch. Let's take one example. It carries fine touch. And what is the other pathway which is going to the dorsal root and crossing in the spinal cord level itself? This is nothing but our pain and temperature pathway. Pain and temperature pathway. As we can see here, these sensory modality have a specific pathway to reach the central nervous system. They have a very specific pathway to reach the central nervous system and whenever they are stimulated, they are going to be carried only in that pathway and they will reach the CNS to produce that particular sensation. So this label line principle is nothing but each sensory modality is carried by a specific tract in the CNS. Here this sensation is called as the label and obviously these tracks are called as the line because they are going and forming like a line. So this concept is called as labeled line principle. The second uh, concept that is specific nerve energy given by Muller, it is also called as Muller's doctrine of specific nerve energy. He says that each sensory pathway conveys the same form of energy that it supposed to convey to the brain. It is again the same principle. Wherein, suppose if I stimulate in various different places, they are going to stimulate the sensation of fine touch in case of the dorsal column. Otherwise, if I stimulate the other tract, it is going to stimulate the sensation of pain and temperature because it is a ventrolateral tract. Now coming to the third law, that is law of projection. This is just a different form of label line principle. For example, the cortex always projects the sensation onto the receptor from which the pathway starts. What does it mean? Suppose if I stimulate this particular area and let's take this area is supplying the hand region. That is the fine touch of the hand region. What will happen is whenever this part is stimulated, the sensation will be exactly felt in this region of the hand because these fibers are innovating that region, that specific region. This we have already seen in our example of phantom limb pain. What was happening to the patient? So this patients, even though whenever their hand is cut and there was a closure of stump and whenever the stump was stimulated, the stump was stimulated, what was happening? The patient was feeling as if the limb is there and pain is arising from the chopped off limb. So what is the issue here? Because this is going to the brain and now the brain perceives 
this sensation from its original track wherever it is coming from where where was the original track the original track was coming from the cut region in the hand and this brain will make feel the person that as if there is a pain in the limb in which it was amputated it is the cortex which is playing these kinds of perceptional magics in the human body and let's try to understand this label line with another beautiful example also suppose in our uh, home we have a switch which is connecting to a fan let's take one switch is connecting to a fan and let's take another switch which is connecting to a light so whenever i stimulate here or the pathway here the fan is going to be stimulated in case of scenario 1 in case of scenario 2 if i switch it on here or the wire here it is going to light the light in the room this is called as label line principle now in label line principle if we are able to change the switch will the end, uh, end point change no for example now let's try to change the switch to the fan will it run the fan obviously it will run the fan now what happens in the human body for example if the fine sensation touch is replaced with the photoreceptors the eye and somehow we are able to stimulate it what will happen whenever these photoreceptors are stimulated and somehow we are making this pathway activated still this will be felt as a touch for example whenever light is falling at that region the person will be able to feel it as touch it is very fascinating but it is the brain which decides ultimately what is the perception of it and can we do a reverse of this now what we are going to do is we are going to leave the switch intact as well as the pathway intact but change the entire perception like the brain cortex for example we will keep it like this the pathway is also same but i change the connection in the brain to that of a light so what has happened whenever this is stimulated it is going to switch on the light in the room can we apply this to the physiological part yes of course we can so for example whenever the sensory receptors which are receiving the sensory stimulus it is going to the somatosensory cortex suppose if we cut this connection instead of going to the somatosensory cortex we are giving it to the visual cortex ideally it doesn't happen this is just an arbitrary situation to see how fascinating the brain is so what happens in this person suppose if somebody is touching this person on the hand he will be seeing some visual images that's how our human brain is very fascinating in many ways I hope you enjoyed the video. Thank you for listening. We'll see you in the next video. If, if you like the content, subscribe to the channel and share it to your friends. Thank you so much.